This is an account given by S. Chakravarti about Krishna Prem, a saintly figure coming to visit Ramana in 1948. Ramana Ashrama. The day soon came for our trip to Tiruvannamalai. Mr. Ghosh insisted on getting the three tickets for us, for Gopalda, that is Krishna Prem, Upadaya, my friend, and myself. We duly arrived late one evening at Tiruvannamalai station and took a jatka, a type of bullock cart drawn by a horse, to Ramana Ashram. Immediately on getting down from the train, I noticed a totally unexpected change in Gopalda, Krishna Prem. He looked grave and solemn, and even appeared reluctant to reply to my questions. He just said yes and no, or just shook his head. When we reached our destination, it was quite dark. Gopalda dumped his two bundles and asked to be taken to the Maharshi. In one bag, he was carrying his Radha Krishna Murtis in a wooden box, which he later told the Maharshi he himself had made. And the second bag was his wearing apparel, the sadhu's okra-colored dhoti. I have to say I was feeling unhappy on account of his seeming taciturnity and was wondering whether I had done something to bring it about. I consulted our other friend, Upadaya, who said he had never known Krishna Prem to be so silent. He too kept wondering at the change. We three started off for the ashram, which, which was only a few minutes walking distance away. Instead of taking the main approach by the side of the office room, I took the straight alleyway which passes between the office room and the dining hall. From where the Maharshi sat in the veranda, one could immediately see anyone who stepped into this alley. I should also explain that the Maharshi hardly ever looked at those who gathered round him. Most often he would just be sitting there, merged in trance, or just sat there looking at, into space, or at the hill, or nothing. But the moment Gopalda stepped into the alley, Ramana turned fully and kept staring with those sparkling eyes of his at Gopalda. We went up to his seat and I bowed down with my forehead touching the ground. Then I looked up and started to tell him about Gopalda, who was lying prostrate before his seat. But the Maharshi stopped me short by waving his Anga Vastra, the cloth commonly worn over the shoulder in South India, impatiently and invited Gopalda to sit near the stone couch on which he was sitting. Here I also must explain that no one was allowed to sit so close to the Maharshi. I also got the impression from the Maharshi's behavior that he already knew Gopalda, so that a formal introduction was not necessary. Then Ramana sent someone to call Sadhu Aranachala, that is Major Chadwick, who had been staying at the ashram for many years. He also directed those in charge of the dining hall to prepare something without chilies for Gopalda and also to arrange for milk. For the few days Gopalda stayed at the ashram, he was always given the first seat at meals, just in front of the Maharshi's seat, so that the Maharshi could see and give necessary instructions Maharshi also took great care in the food prepared for and served to Gopalda All this time Gopalda sat with his head bowed his face appeared to me to be extraordinarily red or flushed then I witnessed a peculiar incident. Gopalda suddenly jerked his head up and looked at the Maharshi, who was seemingly unconcerned. Again, Gopalda bowed his head. Then the Maharshi asked me what arrangements I had made for Gopalda's stay. And he then indicated that as supper time was drawing near, Gopalda might like to go back and have his bath. We got up 
And then Gopalda exchanged a few words with Chadwick near the well, and we walked back to Dr. Syed's place. Gopalda fell silent again and seemed to be in a sort of deep thought. I left instructions that the bath should be filled with water, but Gopalda refused to bathe in that water and asked me to draw fresh water from the well. He had a hurried bath and lit in agarbati, an incense stick, before the images of Radha Krishna, and then we trooped back to the ashram for supper. When we came to the dining hall, we found the Maharshi waiting there for Gopalda. We had supper and returned to our place. Gopalda was deep in thought and kept pacing the veranda in silence. After a little while, I summoned up enough courage to mutter about preparing his bed. He stopped for a moment and said that we need not bother about him, that he would go to bed when he felt sleepy and that we should retire. I was utterly bewildered and knew not what to think of his completely changed behavior. Upadaya and I waited a little longer. Gopalda was still walking up and down the veranda then Upadaya spread his blanket on the floor, and I went back to my room, which was just behind the one intended for Gopalda's use. I whispered to Upadaya that he should call me if necessary. I just did not know what I could or should do. I had a very disturbed night and was up at the crack of dawn to greet the morning. I found that Gopalda was also up. I asked Upadaya if Gopalda had gone to bed last night, but he could not say as he had gone to sleep. We drew fresh water from the well, and Gopalda had his bath. Then he got ready to do his puja. I found that he was carrying water from the Ganga, a stick of sandalwood, tulsi leaves, incense sticks, and oil and wicks for a lamp. He suddenly turned to me and asked if I could not get some fresh flowers. Though I knew there was a garden attached to the ashram, I doubted that an outsider like me would be allowed to pick flowers, but I could try. Just as I stepped out of the room, I found Raja, the ashram postmaster, with something in his hand. I called Gopalda and Raja handed him a small packet of fresh flowers in a plantain leaf. Raja said that the Maharshi personally directed the picking of the flowers and sent them by him. For the first time since his arrival at Tiruvannamalai Station, Gopalda's face lost that strained, stern look. It was beaming with a smile. In a choked voice, he said, Indeed, the Maharshi is Bhagavan. He knew what my heart yearned for. I must explain that the ashramites and devotees habitually referred to the Maharshi as Bhagavan. As we arrived for breakfast, we found the Maharshi was again waiting for Gopalda. Words fail me, and I just don't know how best to convey what lies deep in my heart about this. As a matter of fact, this sort of loving and affectionate respect was bestowed on Gopalda by the Maharshi on each and every occasion. The Maharshi also arranged for Gopalda to be taken round to see the caves and other places where he had stayed before the ashram was built. Then he was taken to have darshan of the lingam in the main temple. But the Purohit did not allow him to enter the sanctum sanctorum on the pretext that he was a yavan, a foreigner. I was amazed at Gopalda's reaction. He was not at all upset or angry. On the contrary, he endorsed the Purohit's action. What he said was something like this. How can a Purohit be expected to know the true character and purpose of a foreigner? Most foreigners indulge in casting aspersions and ridicule and the like. However, Gopalda was shown the Pathala Lingam, the small enclosure where the Maharshi had spent many days merged in trance, oblivious to the outside world. 
As he sat there cross-legged for days and weeks, the backs of his thighs had been eaten away by insects. This was the time for the annual festival called the Karthakai Dikam. Crowds of pilgrims had gathered to attend the festival and to have the Maharshi's darshan. When Gopalda returned from the excursion to the temple, we found a huge crowd of pilgrims sitting in the veranda, engrossed in listening to the Maharshi. This in itself was a strange event, for as I have said, the Maharshi hardly ever spoke to or looked at anyone. Our surprise became boundless when we found everyone looking at Gopalda and smiling and bowing. Later, we were told that, breaking from his usual habit, the Maharshi had been narrating at length the story of Sri Krishna's sojourn in Mathura. And when he came to relate the eventual return of Sri Krishna to Vrindavan, it coincided with Gopalda's return from the outing. This prompted the Maharshi to say something like this, Ah, there you are. Have I not been telling you about Sri Krishna's return from Mathura? See, here returns our Sri Krishna Prem. <laughs> 